Good morning and welcome to worship coming to you from Church of the Palms in Sarasota, Florida. We're so glad that you have joined us for this pre-recorded broadcast coming to you on Sunday, March the 14th. We encourage you to pull yourself apart from your busy life and to allow this to be a time where you can be in prayer and singing and meditation and in a listening spirit as we wonder about God's word together. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Let us worship God.
The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Knowing that, let us pray our confession together. Creator God, you have created us, but we have chosen to go our own way. You have reclaimed us, but we have by our arrogant attitudes and actions rejected the claim. You have sent your Holy Spirit to break into our controlled and unimaginative routines, and we have not appreciated that hurts of creative energy. We are ready now, ready to admit that our ways are full of dangerous byways. Our mistakes and failures have often come because in our false pride, we have not listened to you. Save us again by your forgiving love. Amen. For as heavens are high above as the earth, so great is the steadfast love towards us from God. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our sins from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who love him. For he knows how we are made, he remembers that we are dust. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As God's forgiven children, we affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we come to a time in worship to pass the peace of the Lord to one another. Please pass God's peace to people who are around you and peace of the Lord be with you. Welcome again to worship here at Church of the Palms. We are so glad that you have joined us. We're all anxious to get back to normal and we are grateful to see more and more folks receiving the vaccine. About one out of every 10 folks right now in Sarasota County have been fully vaccinated, still a good long ways away from herd immunity. And even a vaccinated person can pass the virus along to one not vaccinated. So here at Church of the Palms, we are returning to normal in a very gradual way in that we are seeking to hold fast to our commitment to take care of each other. We will take things one step at a time, anticipating our 
Holy Week and Easter celebrations, we've decided to increase our capacity in the sanctuary and campus center on Palm Sunday and Easter to 50%, which means we will have enough space to accommodate those who should choose to worship in person. And of course, the Palm Center will be an overflow space for us. We still require masks and we will refrain from singing throughout Holy Week and Easter. Following Easter, we will evaluate conditions and inform you about taking next steps that would include perhaps further increasing capacity, perhaps introducing singing and worship, or maybe masks being optional. But right now, we will continue to do all that we can to take care of each other. Speaking of Holy Week, Monday, Thursday services will be on April the 1st at 6.30 p.m., both here in person in the sanctuary and live stream. You can register for that service on our website beginning tomorrow, March the 15th. Good Friday, the following day, April the 2nd, again at 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary and live stream, and you can as well register for that service on March the 15th. And then Easter Sunday, we begin at the beach at 6.30 in the morning, Bring your own chair as we will not be providing them this year. On campus services will be here at 9, 10, and 11. Please register starting tomorrow. And of course, we will have our live stream broadcast of our pre recorded service at 9 a.m. You are invited to sponsor Easter flowers for our sanctuary and campus center in memory of or in honor of a special person in your life. Dedications may be done via our website. Click on the Give icon, click the Donate button, and select the Easter Flower Fund. Donations of any amount are welcome. To be included in the bulletin, they must be received by Monday, March the 29th at 10 a.m. Make a point to experience today worship on our website, a wonderfully meditative time for busy people like you. New postings will take place on Saturday, March 27, April 24, and May the 22nd. April the 24th, as we're speaking of it, is that Be Still and Be Well one day women's retreat. The times have been changed a bit from 9.30 to 2 p.m. Join other women for mind, body, and spirit connection through movement, yoga, worship, Bible study. Sign up on our website, and if you are a member of our church, contact Susan Neisler to receive a discount code so that you can register online. For those of you who have been watching our pre-recorded worship on Sunday mornings, we thought it might be fun to show you a little video that captures a little of what goes on behind the curtain or the camera as we sing, as we seek to bring worship into your home. Enjoy. Prior to COVID, all our services were live. When COVID came, we didn't have a congregation, so we had to figure out a way to get our worship service out. So we looked at doing a pre-recorded service. And actually, a pre-recorded service takes more effort than a live service. My role in the pre-recorded services is to modify the sound and to capture the sound for the services. And that ranges from the instruments to the speakers and the voices. The difference between doing a pre-recorded and a live service, the destination of the sound is different. Uh, one being for your devices at home, the other being for the people in the room. It was a learning process as it happened, and we spent time trying things to see what would work, what didn't work. At 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon, just as we're about ready to go into the service, we go over the checklist again. And we're out there, our crew at the edge of the balcony, and uh, uh, Jamdiev is our taskmaster. She goes through the, 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 uh, uh, each part of the bulletin. I can communicate with the whole TV crew and audio crew. I'll be talking on this microphone constantly. I think the, the crew gets tired of hearing me, but my voice is constantly going because I'm looking at camera one, camera two, camera three. I've been operating camera number two up here on the balcony, which uh, does most of the speakers, the ministers, and the head-on shots. So there's a lot of kind of components for what we hear because it's a component to the visual side. And 
and I want to make sure that everything that you can hear at home is uh, a representation of the quality that we have here at Church of the Palms. For those who can't come in person uh, or those who are traveling, those who are taking different precautions during times like this and need to stay at home, it gives them access to still worship with us from home. I hear comments mostly secondhand. Sometimes I get the emails. And the common thread is, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been a lifeline for us. We are able to continue our relationship with God and our extended family at church. Some people that aren't able to get out or don't feel safe are now able to stay in touch with church. They are in their living rooms and we can be there with them. The crew is very dedicated. I, I love them to death. They, they do a great job. Oh, oh. 
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this day, which marks a year since we did the unthinkable and closed our doors and kept to our homes and protected ourselves from each other and wondered what was to become of all this. On this day, when we look back and try to take in the past year and what it has done to us and what it has done for us. On this day, when we remember those we've loved with whom we have sheltered, those we've loved whom over this year we've not been able to see, or those we love whom we will never see again except in communion with you. On this day, we turn to you and praise you for the hope and the strength and the love with which we have been surrounded. Some days over this past year, we wondered if we could get ourselves even to the next day. Some weeks felt like they might never end. Some months brought worse news than the month before. Some seasons we celebrated as if in a foreign land. And yet you were the one who walked with us through the valley of the shadow. You were the one who gave us a will and purpose to go on. You were the one who called us to take care of each other. You were the one who gave us the church through which to be light in the world. Oh Lord, we have been shaped and changed. We are not the same people we were a year ago. We have learned things we would never have learned about you and about ourselves. We have prayed like we never before prayed. We have worried like we never before worried. We have Zoomed like we never before Zoomed. We have given thanks like we never before have given thanks. And like our friend Noah, we all felt like we were all in the same boat. Oh God, we thank you that we are all in the same boat. By the grace of your son Jesus and through the waters of baptism, you have placed us all in the same boat of grace and mercy. You have looked kindly upon us despite our circumstances, and you have assured us that you are always with us even to the close of the age. Let this not be lost upon us, O oh Lord. Help us not to forget to see each other as shipmates as fellow passengers in the voyage of life, that despite the winds and the waves and the viruses and the inequities and the different colors, we are all set upon the waters of your promise, captained by our Christ, bound for glory. For the journey is not over, we know, O oh Lord. There are vaccines to take, people still to protect, injustices still to rectify, there are children still to be baptized. There are enemies still to love. There is good news still to proclaim. So lead on, O King Eternal. Lead on in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we've just mentioned, it is the one year anniversary from the beginning of the pandemic. We think back of all the worries we had at this very moment a year ago, our fear of the unknown and our concerns with how we would be able to continue to spread God's love in a new virtual world. How can we not fall to our knees with gratitude today, one full year later, as we see signs of normalcy on the horizon? We've been through a lot, and God has always been here for us and with us. 
As we pause for a moment of gratitude, may we remember all the incredible blessings that have descended upon us in the midst of our challenges. The four ways of giving are listed on your screens, and we thank you, Church of the Palms friends, for helping our ministries continue to strive so we could assist those in need. Let us give with joyful hearts, and may God continue to bless us all. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Morning by morning, I wake up to find the power and courage of God's hand in mine. Season by season, I watch him amazed in awe of the mystery of his perfect ways. All I have need of, his hand will prove. He's always been faithful to me. I can't remember a trial or pain. He did not recycle or bring me gain. I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting his hand. All I have need of his hand will
Let us pray. Gracious God, your hand has provided in wonderful ways in the hardest of times, and we have witnessed how your faithfulness and compassion indeed never end. Like a shepherd, you are gently leading us to greener pastures, and it is with a heart filled with gratitude that we offer our gifts to you today, these gifts that belong to you in the first place. May they bless others as we have been blessed. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Good morning, children. I hope you're coming to the screen wherever you can see. I have a question. Do you remember your baptism, being baptized? Well, some people get baptized as babies like me. They told me I was nine months old when I was baptized. So I don't remember my baptism. If you are baptized a bit older and you remember, sometimes people are baptized even as an adult. Today, Pastor Laurie will be preaching about baptism and all that good stuff a little bit later. I want to remind you that even Jesus got baptized in the River Jordan. You know, I don't know, I have never been to River Jordan. I don't know what color the water is there, but John the Baptist was there baptizing Jesus in River Jordan. And so as they do over there, he dunked Jesus in there. And then when Jesus came back up from the water, a dove come down from heaven. And you know, a dove is also a sign of the Holy Spirit. And the voice said, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. So when you get baptized, you know that God is very pleased with you and welcome you into his family as a member of his family family and water when you drink water or touch water remember you're a part of god's family and water is also used because it cleans us from all our sins let us pray our most gracious and loving god we are so grateful and very thankful that you baptize us like you had john baptize jesus help us to always remember that we are part of your family and you love us in jesus name we pray amen thank you
Well, good morning. We are continuing our preaching series on the fruit of the Spirit, and this month we are talking about faithfulness. We're exploring the signs of God's faithfulness as we consider our response. Last week, Steve preached on the sign of the rainbow, and this week we're going to talk about baptism, as you heard in the children's moment. The title of my sermon is The Weight of of water. The first scripture passage is the story of the baptism of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. Hear the word of the Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The second passage is from Galatians 3, verses 25 through 28. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Be still. Be loved. That's the breath prayer that I am using each day of Lent. I love breath prayers. You may be familiar with them. You breathe in a phrase and you breathe out a phrase. And I want to tell you why I chose it, or perhaps why it chose me. As a church staff, we have been reading books on and discussing the Enneagram, which is a geometric figure that delineates the nine basic personality types of human nature and their complex interrelationships. Personality is a well-forged strategy to both thrive and cope in a beautiful and broken world. A.J. Sherrill calls the Enneagram a helpful tool to discover your deepest identity. Identity is complicated. The world would say our identity is our career, our race, our income, our gifts, our gender, our personality, our sexuality, and our talents. If we take a step back to the very beginning in Genesis 1.27, we read, humankind was created as God's reflection. In the divine image, God created them. Female and male, God made them. So before these first human beings did anything, they were named and claimed by God. When we turn to the New Testament, we just heard how God names and claims Jesus at his baptism. You are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This title of beloved is given to Jesus 
Before he preaches any sermons, calls any disciples, or performs consistent miracles throughout Judea, important to note, identity is received, not achieved. The foundation of belovedness is being, not doing. Beloved, belovedness is not dependent on personality or gifting or any of those traits with which the world identifies us. Belovedness simply is. We are beloved because we are made in the image of God, period. In God's faithfulness, we are named and claimed at our baptism. If we believe that God is in the business of transforming our lives and shaping us to become more and more like Jesus, the Enneagram is a tool we can use to partner with God in the process. And everything begins with self-awareness. Can I say that again? Everything begins with self-awareness. The Enneagram helps people to develop that kind of self-knowledge that they need to understand who they are and why they see and relate to the world the way they do. And when that happens, you can start to get out of your own way and become more of the person God created you to be. Brother Dave, a Benedictine monk, calls the Enneagram a tool to help you deepen your love for God and for others. Sounds kind of like our mission statement, doesn't it? Well, I happen to be a type three, which is called the achiever. As you might imagine by the title, my natural wiring and go-to behavior is getting her done all by myself, thank you very much, in a competent and efficient way. Like many of you, I'm sure that doing is way easier than being. We threes have the extra bonus of having our worth deeply connected to achieving, accomplishing, and winning. Now, achieving and, accomplish and accomplishing aren't all bad, of course. But the word I really need to hear from God on this day and every day is the one we heard in our scripture passage today, that I am loved for myself not for anything I do or don't do. Be still, be loved. It's like that silly movie called Cool Runnings, loosely based on the true exploits of the Jamaican bobsled sled team that competed in the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary. Actor John Candy plays the team's coach, who was an Olympic gold medalist in the sport himself. However, Coach Irv was forced to retire in disgrace when he was caught cheating while competing to win his second gold. Now, years later, a member of his Jamaican team was filled with self-doubt, not sure if he had what it takes. Coach Irv, finally, having learned from his own mistakes, sagely counseled him, saying, a gold medal is a wonderful thing to achieve, but if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Be still, be loved. In her book, Searching for Sunday, Rachel Held Evans wrote, the great struggle of the Christian life is to take God's name for us, to believe we are beloved, and to believe that is enough. So I wondered if you too might be parched and in need of this good word. It was a word Fayette was desperate to hear, yet she could scarcely imagine that it was a word ever meant for her. You see, Fayette lived with mental illness and lupus and without a home. Years ago, she joined the new member class at a church in Nashville, Tennessee. Pastor Janet was teaching about baptism, saying, It is truly this holy moment when we are named by God's grace with such power, it won't come undone. 
This concept of belovedness especially grabbed Fayette's imagination. Fayette would again and again say, and when I'm baptized, I am, and the class learned to respond, beloved, precious child of God, and beautiful to behold. Oh yes, she'd say, and then they would go back to their discussion. The day of Fayette's baptism came. Fayette went under, came up sputtering and cried, and now I am. And everyone sang, beloved, precious child of God, and beautiful to behold. Oh, yes, she sang out as she danced around the fellowship hall. Two months later, Pastor Janet got a call that Fayette had been beaten and raped and was at the county hospital. When Janet got to the hospital, she could see Fayette from a distance, pacing back and forth. When Janet got to the door, she heard these words, I am beloved. When Fayette saw Janet, she said, I am beloved, precious child of God. And catching sight of herself in the mirror, hair sticking up, blood and tears streaking her face, dress torn, dirty, rebuttoned askew, Fayette started again. I am beloved, precious child of God. And she looked at the mirror again and said, and God is still working on me. If you come back tomorrow, I'll be so beautiful, I'll take your breath away. Be still, be loved. Could it be that water Ordinary water in a baptismal font could do all of that. I say yes. Water and the Holy Spirit. Water and the communion of saints who have come before us. Water and the faith family who promises to journey with us. You see, water doesn't discriminate. If you sink below it for too long, it will end your life, regardless of what color your skin is or what country you come from. It doesn't matter if you live in a gated community or in a tin shack. It is this same water that is used to claim us as a beloved child of God, beautiful to behold. And if you or someone you love has yet to be baptized, I would just like to encourage you to reach out to me or one of the pastors. It's never too late. Did you know that one of the earliest names for the Christian movement was the way. Because the faith was not understood as a set of ideas or intellectual beliefs, but as a journey down a road, a way of life. Just as Jesus came out of the baptismal waters of the Jordan River and set out for the road to the cross, in the same way, Christians pass through the waters of baptism and they begin to travel following the path of Jesus. Christians do not take this road alone, but they travel in the company of the saints. Those being baptized are visibly and audibly surrounded by the faithful who pray and make promises to these new Christians along their baptismal way. As a faith family, we promise to endeavor by our example and fellowship to strengthen their ties with the household of God. For children being baptized, we promise to undertake with the parents the Christian nurture of their child so that in due time the children will confess their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Baptism unites us. It gets us on the same team. The Apostle Paul reminds us that through Christ in baptism, we are made one. 
The baptism of Jesus isn't a preamble to all that comes later in his life. Rather, it is the high point and climax of the story. The heavens are torn open, the spirit descends, and God speaks. It's like the heavens could not contain the gospel love of God, and it just had to spill out on everything. Again and again, Jesus casts out unclean spirits. He heals the sick, feeds the, the hungry, and he welcomes the outcast. And he will only do to others what has already been done to him, telling them with word and deed that they too are beloved children of God with whom God is well pleased. Baptism enacts and seals what the word proclaims, God's redeeming grace offered to all people. And that is the weight of water. Dying to our old way of life and being born anew in Christ means that we embrace our own belovedness and that we live in such a way that others will know themselves as named by God, beloved by God, especially those who have been given cause to think they are less than loved. It's what a Polish rabbit farmer did for a Jewish girl. A young Jewish couple were married three weeks before they were deported to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, they were separated, and the groom would go every evening to the fence separating the men from the women to bring his new bride a crust of bread or an extra potato if he could, or even just to see her. He did this until she was transferred to a rabbit farm on the outskirts of Auschwitz. The Nazis were doing experiments on rabbit, rabbits that had to do with finding a cure for typhus. The rabbit farm was run by a Polish man who noticed pretty early on that the rabbits were getting better quality food and attention and care than the Jewish slave laborers. So he started to sneak in food for them. Well, one day the young bride cut her arm on a piece of barbed wire and the cut became infected. It wasn't a serious infection if you had antibiotics. But of course, if you were a Jew in that place, in that time, there was no way that you were going to get antibiotics. So what did this Polish man do who was running the rabbit farm? He cut his own arm wide open, and he placed his wound on her wound so that he would get the infection that she had, and he did. So he went to the Nazis, and he said, I'm one of your best managers. This rabbit farm is very productive. If I die, you're going to lose a lot of productivity. I need medicine. They gave him medicine, and he shared it with her and he saved her life. Beloved, precious child of God, beautiful to behold. In our Reformed tradition, baptism is viewed as a response to God's grace. You see, God is always faithful, and God always makes the first move. This is why we baptize young children, like our sweet little Riley Grace, who will be baptized in the nine o'clock service on Sunday. God names and claims us before we can even say, I believe. Of course, our hope is that our kids are nurtured in the faith and that during confirmation around eighth grade, that they might claim their faith as their own. And our hope is that they embark on a lifelong journey of discovering more and more who Jesus is so that their lives might be transformed more and more into his likeness. We are all given the opportunity to respond to the faithfulness of God. I love the first verse of that classic hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Listen now. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been before will be. 
if only we could be so faithful, so compassionate, but we're not. We need reminders along the way. We need accountability, friends. We need renewal. We need grace and mercy. But when we lose our way, it might be helpful to remember that God never gives up on us and that God can use this too. In his book, Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson wrote, there is a strength, a power even, in understanding brokenness because embracing our brokenness creates a need and desire for mercy and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. When you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise. You see things you can't otherwise see. You hear things you can't otherwise hear. You begin to recognize the humanity that resides in each one of us. Be still. Be loved. There's something about the knowledge that we belong to God. Perhaps it is this knowing that each of us is a child of God, holy and beloved, that moves us to show compassion and mercy when we could punish or hurt back, whether she's a mentally ill woman like Fayette or a young Jewish woman at a rabbit farm. One of my favorite Lenten devotions this year has been from Hagar's Community Church, which is located inside of the Washington Correction Center for Women. The book is called Fury and Grace, 40 Days of Paintings and Poetry from Prison. A prisoner named Rachel wrote this poem called He Spoke. Suddenly it came. Tears slowed, sobbing stopped, looking up to the dove in the window, the warm, heavy, forgiving embrace welcoming me. Instead of remorse, fear, regret, I felt hope. Instead of shame, purpose, it's not too late to hope God speaks in that still, small voice that could be so easily ignored, so often forgotten, dismissed. He reminds you to whom you belong, and with that reminder comes floods of determination and courage to do something about it. Ah, the weight of water to accept the belovedness of our own life and to recognize it in others. Be still, be loved.
Friends, this week, every time we run our hands underneath the water, I'd like to invite us each to whisper these words, I am a beloved, precious child of God and beautiful to behold. And then my hope and my prayer is that we live as if it is true. And now may the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow through your hearts so that all might see and believe. And all God's children said, Amen.